hallelujah chorus from Messiah, a piece which is woven into the fabric of our national life. But it was written by a German, George Frederick Handel, a brilliant yet volatile composer who came to Britain to make his fortune and wound up enriching and redefining our musical life. <laughs> Here he is, cemented into the wall in Westminster Abbey as a national icon, carved from the life and holding the manuscript of his most famous work, Messiah. But how did a foreign composer become such a celebrity here? And what is it about his music that still captivates and fascinates us today? Handel's capacity to write a melody which reflects emotion is brilliant. He really gets people going, you know, he, re he can come and move you and get right into the depth of your soul and then yank you back out. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! You've got to attack it! My journey will take me back 250 years to some of the places Handel lived and worked in order to discover the man behind the music. He was almost like, in the cultural sphere, the equivalent of, of the king. I mean, the king was German. The top cultural figure was German. Handel wrote some of the greatest music of his, or I think, any age. He took Britain as his home, and the British took him to their hearts. He is our greatest adopted musical genius, and we're proud to continue performing his music. Handel seems to bestride the centuries as a musical conquering hero. His coronation anthem, Zadok the Priest, gives us some clues about the unique and enduring qualities of Handel's genius. Its extraordinary slow burning crescendo builds up to an awe inspiring climax evoking all the pomp and majesty of the occasion. It was written 300 years ago for the coronation of King George II and has been used at every coronation since then. across the world heard the music of Handel when Elizabeth II was crowned Queen at Westminster Abbey in 1953. But Handel's fame and popularity are not just a modern phenomenon. Few, if any, composers have been as celebrated during their lifetime as George Frederick Handel. At the start of the 18th century, London was the fastest growing and wealthiest city in Europe. When the ambitious young keyboard virtuoso and composer arrived here in 1711, he had a master plan. He was 27 years old and in love with Italian opera. And his plan was to establish this sophisticated European art form in the United Kingdom. He announced his arrival on the London scene with Rinaldo, the first Italian opera to be composed specifically for the British stage. The rich and the fashionable flocked to the opera drawn to its story of love in a time of war, complete with a beautiful princess, a spiteful enchantress, and a host of chivalrous knights and crusaders. But it wasn't just the lavish orchestration or the spectacular scenic effects, which included the release into the theater of a flock of starlings, or even his own keyboard fireworks that made this young cosmopolitan composer the talk of the town. It was his singers. London had never seen or heard anything before like these singers. Brought over from Italy at huge expense, they were simply the best in the world. 
their exotic personalities off stage attracting almost as much attention as the music they sang. Handel was in pop culture terms at the top of his game. His arias read the way people listen to songs, to popular songs today, and they were as popular in his time as they are now. Lasha Kyopianga's very dramatic piece, there is a dichotomy between the dignity of the music and the sort of wallowing sadness of a young girl. You've got this beautiful, simple melody. You, it couldn't be more simple. She sings about weeping for her fate, and she says it over and over again, and it does sound like somebody who can't get the words out, and Handel writes it beautifully. He actually literally cuts the phrase in two. Mia cru da sorte, like, just like somebody who would be crying and is whimpering and can't get it out. Handel's operatic genius was to be able to reach out beyond the conventions of the high Baroque, to present his audience with characters who, through music, express vivid human emotions. These are people that, in different circumstances, could almost be you or me. Vofar Guerra is sung by Armida, who's the sorceress in Rinaldo. It's an aria about revenge, it's an aria about uh, vendetta, it's an aria about rejection even, because she discovers that her consort has been unfaithful to her and is in fact not in love with her, but in love with the princess. She has everything, she has power, she's magnetic, she's strong, but she doesn't have love. And that uh, is a, quite a telling thing actually, that that propels her to revenge and to hurt. uses triplets to keep banging in this idea of vendetta, of this sort of gnawing, gnawing jealousy that she has. It's used in a sort of knife wound, you know, I'm going to keep pushing the dagger in deeper and deeper. Ronaldo was a massive public success with an unprecedented three-month run. But for the ambitious young composer, it was also a personal success. He'd found the audience he needed, and he was determined to give them what they needed. Sophisticated Italian opera, Handel style. But where did all this burning ambition come from? I've traveled to Handel's birthplace, the town of Halle, in eastern Germany. At the end of the 17th century, a certain Georg Handel, together with his second wife, Dorothea, lived here at the house at the sign of the Yellow Stag, earning a comfortable living as a barber surgeon 
with a sideline in selling wine. They're currently stripping the house back to its original 17th century core, giving us a tantalising glimpse into the fashionable middle-class affluence the Handel family must have aspired to. This is supposed to be the room where, on the 23rd of February 1685, Georg Friedrich Handel was born. Every biography has two or three charming anecdotes about his childhood, but in reality we know virtually nothing about Handel's early years, apart from the fact that he had a huge propensity for music, something which apparently alarmed Georg Sr. His ambition was for his son to enter a respectable profession and become a lawyer. Musical instruments were banned from the house and the father did everything he could to discourage his son. But when the boy was 12, Georg Sr. died. With his father gone, nothing could stand in the way of the young George Frederick. And the church offered multiple opportunities for music making and access to instruments. So, here at the market church in Halle, the teenage Handel, already a devout Protestant, would come to worship, but also to improve his skills on the organ. And here it is, built in 1664, just 30 years before Handel would have sat right down here and played it. sounding as sweet as ever, best part of 350 years later. Driven by his huge talent and ambition, Handel left provincial Halle at 17. He spent his early 20s travelling across Europe, developing a passion for Italian opera and extending his skills in church music. Dixit Dominus in his early 20s during a lengthy stay in Rome. A Latin psalm set in the most fashionable, rich Roman Catholic style by a Lutheran Protestant. By the time he arrived in London, the talented boy from the provinces had become a sophisticated cosmopolitan composer. He was the right man in the right place at exactly the right time. On the 20th of October 1714, British politics changed forever when Prince Georg Ludwig of Hanover was crowned George I, King of Great Britain and Ireland. The United Kingdom had a German monarch. With his reputation for musical brilliance, Handel, London's most fashionable German, was the natural choice when George I decided he needed some special propaganda music. The idea was to make the new foreign king literally visible to his subjects. He and his entourage would glide down the Thames in a flotilla of barges to the sound of Handel's music. Cleverly, Handel introduced hunting horns into his floating orchestra, exploiting their ability to sound bright and pure across vast distances. The water music was a triumph. The king was delighted and Handel became a royal favourite.
he's a much grander, more politically connected figure as a musician than anyone else I can think of. His main feature, in a way, apart from his brilliance as a composer, is this incredible chameleon-like capacity to, to take on styles and forms and to, to fit in wherever he wanted to fit in. Handel's enormous natural talent as a musician made him both prolific and versatile. But I think his restlessness and ambition drove him to experiment, constantly seeking out opportunities to explore new sounds and styles. Which is why, in the early years of George I's reign, he moved just outside London to what is now the residential suburb of Cannons Park. For the next two years, he lived here as house guest and resident composer to James Bridges, Duke of Chandos, and master of a huge country estate called Cannons. From suburbia to parkland, you can still see the drive. Handel used his stay here as an opportunity to play with all sorts of new ideas, including his first English language opera, Asis and Galatea, set to words by another of Bridges' house guests, a young poet called John Gay. The palatial mansion is long gone, but a fragment of the property survives as the local parish church. What a place. This is the only continental Baroque parish church in the country. The Duke of Chandos, James Bridges, who uh, rebuilt this church in 1715, he was very much a person who wanted to be extravagant and wanted people to see how much money he had, even though it was really bad money. Uh, money which he'd made as paymaster general to the Duke of Marlborough, working on the basis that uh, you employ mercenaries, you invest the money, you don't pay them until they get back. And uh, when they get back, obviously, there's been natural wastage, so you can cream off the rest of the money for yourself. And he wanted to let people see him sitting in the Duke's pew there on a Sunday morning, enjoying the fashionable music of the day. He's putting on a big show, isn't he? I mean, it's a massive display of ostentation. He's setting himself up almost like the king there. Very, very much so. I mean, basically, all he was interested in was listening to, to Handel. In fact, that's why he built this place very much as an opera house. If you look, you've got the proscenium arch, you've got the stage itself where the altar is now. The badinage would have been situated on the stage. The church band, as it were, with the, the organ as a centrepiece. It's quite unusual that you see the organ directly behind the altar. I mean, it's like music is also sacred here. Gay and Handel's opera conjured up an innocent pastoral idyll of nymphs and shepherds, exactly the kind of enchanted world that James Bridges wanted canons to be. The flocks shall leave the mountains, the woods the turtle dove, the nymphs forsake the fountains, and I forsake my love. The flocks shall leave the mountains, the woods the turtle dove. The music takes its cue from the sweet, simple style of the poetry, floating the words on clouds of florid Baroque phrases. But when a jealous mythological giant enters the story, Handel's able to capture all the harsh directness of the English language without breaking the spell. As exciting and sexy as it is formal and elegant, Aces and Galatea seems to me to be the German-speaking composer tackling the English language head-on 
and emerging joyously triumphant, much to the evident delight of his patron, James Bridges. All of this opulence, this kitsch, um, you have to admire the man. I mean, he had balls, didn't he? We'd have thought, here's this nouveau riche guy. He wants to make himself just like the aristocracy. But no, he's, he's more than that. He wants to actually better them. He, he wants to better them, but equally, it's also very much skin deep. The outside of the church is very, very plain. The brickwork outside is quite shoddy. I mean, this is very much scenery. This church was all about music. And he wanted to show off by employing Handel. Handel's relationship with his patrons demonstrates his extraordinary astuteness for dealing with people who have financial control and potentially artistic control over him, but dealing with them on his own terms. Asus and Galatea allowed Handel to explore his dramatic talents at a time when it wasn't possible to perform English language opera in the London theatres. It was typical of Handel. He'd achieved his goal, and it was time to move on. He remained autonomous, even perhaps aloof. His brilliant talent put him in a class all of his own, and he knew it. His first love was still Italian opera, and returning to London, he set out to prove that fashionable society simply couldn't exist without it. London was an incredibly vigorous, town obsessed by fashion, what they called the taste of the town, and it kept changing. And it was because it was, it was free and open and there was a lot of money. From now on, Handel would compose and stage a big new Italian opera every year. Fearsomely expensive productions with star salaries for the singers, big orchestras and elaborate stage effects. And to meet the enormous cost of the enterprise, he did what any enterprising 18th century businessman did. He formed a limited company and sold shares. Shares in an opulent dream world of the imagination. Handel's ability to create epic tales, people with recognizable human characters, like Cleopatra and Julius Caesar, meant that again and again his operas hit the bullseye as popular successes, and his artistic and commercial master plan brought him real rewards. Handel moved into the fashionable new Mayfair district, just the sort of area where his rich and cultured opera audience lived. And he rented this modern house because, as a foreigner, he wasn't actually allowed to own property. Hello. Hello, Charles. Welcome to Handel House. Good to be here. So we're one floor up. That's correct. Downstairs was... The reception area is on the ground floor. This is the first floor. And the front room here, we know from records that Handel actually rehearsed in this space. We have records of there being up to 20 people in this room at one time. No which, when you consider the size of clothing they wore in those days, is quite a feat, I think. Yeah. These details at the end of the stairs are one of the few original features from the house when Handel moved in. Yeah, I was going to ask, I mean, how much of what we can see today is exactly what was here then? The majority of it is a very faithful representation of what the house looked like. So this is Handel's bedroom, the only private space of a very public man. 
And colour scheme wise, if you sort of try to reproduce what you perceive him to have had. Absolutely. In fact, the colour from the walls, this grey colour, um, is actually copied from one piece of the original panelling that was left upstairs, where we stripped back something like 28 different coats of paint, which gave a history of the colour of the house. And the very last colour, which would have been the first one applied, was this colour. So wow, so it's a real forensic on. job you had to do. Absolutely, actually. absolutely. Just how fashionable was Mayfair at the time? It was still being built, but it was just at the point where Mayfair was beginning to become very fashionable indeed. It was at this point that Handel seems to have decided to take the ultimate step and become a British citizen. In 1727, George I dies whilst visiting Germany and the throne is taken by his son, George II. One of the last acts of George I had been the naturalization of Handel. It was partly a practical move because it gave him a greater sense of security. It allowed him opportunities as a composer that he wouldn't have had otherwise, one such opportunity being to compose the music for George II's coronation. Handel was now entering middle age and beginning to put on weight. He composed with a seemingly inexhaustible energy and his work would have undoubtedly made him rich if he hadn't continuously put all the cash into the opera company. He was by then a Londoner. He was a person that people recognised and was a visible public figure. There's a sort of parody of Handel with a heavy German accent. Now, I don't quite believe that. I think he had a forceful way, a rather heavy way of speaking English. It was said he could swear in four or five tongues, as it were. He could manage Latin and, and English and German and French, as well as Italian. His public profile made him the butt of numerous jokes. Cartoonists depicted him as a greedy, selfish brute. Literally, a pig in a wig. But it wasn't just the man himself, it was his entire artistic project that was fair game. And the greatest satirist of them all, William Hogarth, launched his career with an etching that lampooned Handel's Italian opera. Uh, this is the print I, I want to show you to start with. Uh, this is um, the one that Hogarth referred to as the bad taste of the town. And on the left here, we have the building in which Handel's Italian operas were put on at. And this show cloth here shows a scene from an Italian opera. And we have here this central figure, the leading Italian diva of the day, Madame Cuzzoni. She's got two Roman guards either side of her. It's probably Giulio Cesare. And we can see this nobleman here. He's got this little bubble which says, pray accept 8,000 pounds. That's about a million in today's money. And um, he's pouring out a sack of gold coins in front of her. And um, we can see that Madame Cuzzoni is holding a rake. So she is literally raking it in. <laughs> the worst was to come. A new musical sensation was about to deliver a fatal blow to Handel's master plan. The Beggar's Opera was something totally new, a caustic musical satire that ripped into the corruption at the heart of 18th century society. It was constructed out of 70 already well-known songs, street music, folk tunes and works by Purcell and Handel, all given savage and witty new lyrics by Handel's former collaborator from Canons, John Gay. Instead of employing well-known professional singers, Gay assembled a cast of energetic young actors who sang like the man in the street. To London audiences, the Beggar's Opera must have sounded like something totally radical and modern. 
By taking a contemporary approach to the music, I hope to capture some of the impact the work must originally have had when it really was the shock of the new. The mouths of cock so common have grown that a true friend can hardly be met. Friendship or interest is but a loan which they let out for what they can get. Tis true you find some friends so kind who give you good counsel themselves to defend. In sorrowful ditty, they promise they pity, but ship you money from friend to friend. John Gay's English lyrics spoke directly to the audience in a way that Handel's Italian operas never could. He peopled the stage, not with kings and queens and gods and goddesses, but with real London lowlife, the highwayman Macheath and assorted pickpockets and prostitutes. Gay's subject was the theft of innocence in a corrupt world. Virgins are like the fat Virgins are like the fair flowers. It starts off with her talking about the fair flowers and how wonderful this is, but how, like, as soon as they're plucked, that their worth is just completely lost and they end up, you know, on the scrap heap, basically, but which kind of in those days, that's how it was. That was the harsh reality of it. But when once plucked, This song seethes with all of Gay's moral outrage at the exploitation of the weak by the rich and powerful. He hammers it home when the villainous Macheath is reprieved from execution at the last moment in a ludicrous send-up of the conventional happy ending of an Italian opera. To the tune of Greensleeves, Macheath claims that thanks to their money, the upper classes always get away with their crimes. Since laws were made from every degree, need to curb vice in others as well as me. I wonder we had better company upon Tyburn Tree. The popular success of the Beggar's Opera was simply staggering. It was performed in London every season for the next 100 years. It was genuinely something new. I'd call it the first British musical. And it was a success that hit Handel where it hurt him most, at the box office. In the 1730s, there were problems. People said, the theatre's going to be a bit empty tonight. And Handel said, well, the musicals sound better. Uh, with fewer people in the audience, there'll be a, a bit more resonance in there. It was obviously a, a very personal matter. He actually signs a letter which is published in the papers saying, I have done my best for the London audience, but find they're not turning up. Finally, the spiralling financial difficulties bankrupted his opera company. And after 25 years in Britain, Handel's cherished dream was coming to an end. In 1741, Handel is finally forced to give up on opera when his new work, Diadania, is an ignominious failure and is taken off after just three performances. Typically, Handel got over his disappointment in crafting a new masterpiece, Messiah. <laughs> devout Protestant and regular worshipper at St George's Hanover Square, Messiah was a personal expression of faith.
composed in just 24 days, it combined his love of church music with his passion for opera. Celebrating Jesus' significance for all humanity with a text drawn from the Bible and, crucially, in English. And this was the turning point. This is when, for me, Handel ceased to be an illustrious composer from abroad but became one of us. He'd discovered the ideal vehicle for his musical ambitions. Messiah is an oratorio, a kind of narrative concert previously unknown in the UK. Dramatic texts could be played out in non-theatrical space, with no expensive scenery or costumes, all bound together by thrilling choruses that could be sung by pretty much every man. Through these collective experiences, Handel started a very British choral revolution. It's thanks to him that even today there are probably more choral societies per square inch in our country than in most others. We British love to sing. Handel saw it and harnessed it. The Hallelujah Chorus is the centrepiece of the oratorio. When George II first heard it, he spontaneously got to his feet. Because the king had stood up, everyone else had to stand audience and musicians. Massar is without doubt Handel's masterpiece, a massive artistic success, but also just the popular success his career needed. And it was the Hallelujah Chorus that really seized the public imagination. With a little bit of rehearsal, anybody can be a part of it. And here in a school hall in Somerset, I brought the pupils together with singers from half a dozen local choral societies for a Hallelujah Chorus crash course. OK. We're going to start soft and we're going to do a slow, fantastic build for eight Hallelujahs. Here's a chord. Big, big breath like you're going to yawn. Three, four. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. I want to feel real power on. Ha! Ready? Go! Ha! 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 Good. That is the power that we need every time you sing the word hallelujah. Ha! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! The secret of the Hallelujah Chorus's success is its blood pulsing rhythm. In three and a half minutes, there are over 70 hallelujahs. An unstoppable, jubilant repetition. Hallelujah. hallelujah! Hallelujah! You've got to attack it. Two, three, go! Like King George, you have to respond. Again. And respond to it physically. Oh, hallelujah! 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 Right, this is getting very good indeed. You may think I'm trying to get you to sing in the equivalent of a kind of death metal. <laughs> and you wouldn't be far wrong. I believe that the act of singing, no matter what it is, is good for you. But Handel intended that singing hallelujah would be good for your body and for your soul. Soon after Massar's first performance, a friend congratulated Handel on the success of his noble entertainment. His reply was that he'd be sorry if he'd only entertained his audience. I wished, he declared, to make them better. I buy that. I buy that. that we have... Power. We have pizzazz. Two, three, four. <laughs> After less than an hour, there's an audible improvement. It's almost impossible to sing this piece of music with a reserved and reverent attitude. It's as if Handel wrote a sense of instant community into his score. 
it sounded so great. Um, they just all started singing. It was such a big kind of volume. It was amazing. I'm really passionate, and it just felt really good to be part of it. The energy builds, and you feed on each other's energy, and, and it really gives you a bit of extra lift. It was quite cool to be a part of it, and it was good to sing as well. The young trebles today are 11, the same age as I was when I first sang the Christmas music of the Messiah, which was in 1944. It sounded awesome. I love the sound of it. Very good. Give yourselves a round of applause. Before his 50th birthday, Handel was invited here to Oxford University to become the first ever recipient of an honorary degree in music. And this exceptional gesture from the heart of the British establishment was testimony not just to his status as a composer, but to his huge impact on the musical and cultural life of the nation. To mark the occasion, he organised a series of concerts here at the Sheldonian Theatre. But what did this academic distinction really mean to Handel? He seems to have been so busy organising, performing and collecting his substantial box office receipts that he never actually got around to picking up his degree. The oratorio form gave Handel the freedom to organise his concerts with supreme flexibility and flair. Even a three-movement harp concerto could be inserted comfortably into the texture of arias and choruses. All of Handel's problems were solved. Oratorio concerts were cheap to stage, audiences found them both respectable and uplifting, and he could experiment freely. However, when he presented as an oratorio the secular, even saucy story of Semele, he was to discover that perhaps the form did have its limitations. It's about telling a story, and Handel does that through his music. But we as performers, we have to take this music and do it through our bodies. He wrote so well in the English language. I mean, you can sing it in a very upright, in a very sort of pristine way, and you can sing it in a very sensual way. It's a gavotte, so it's always sort of moving over to the downbeat, always. And so this endless pleasure and this love simply enjoys above. And, you know, the, the music just is a continual joy. Handel's audience was confused. The stories in oratorios were meant to be upright, at least biblical, and yet Semele is drawn from the classical and slightly erotic Ovid's Metamorphoses. Semele was, they suspected, something slightly louche, an opera in disguise. Overall, it was a failure, and I think for Handel, a hurtful failure, but it did yield one rich tenor aria, which was and continues to be hugely popular.
It's an interesting example of the fact that Handel so often tried and didn't always necessarily succeed. This is a bit of a flop when it opened. Yeah, but I think it's, it's gone on sort of from strength to strength and some of the things that we love most of Handel's are from this. So in the long run, he won out. <laughs> you do feel that he did end up British, didn't you? Because the way he sets English language is so extraordinarily good. Yes, and I mean, I, I think he always spoke with a sort of German accent, but he'd adopted Englishness in the most extraordinary way. And I mean, he became this amazing symbol of Britishness. He was almost like a sort of, in the cultural sphere, the equivalent of, of the king. I mean, the king was German, top cultural figure was German. Handel's best tunes always reach out to the widest possible audience. Spring Gardens on the south bank of the Thames was once part of Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens, a vast and hugely popular 18th century entertainment complex dominated by a statue of the hero of British culture, George Frederick Handel. The people themselves were part of the entertainment. They saw themselves as part of this unfolding, constantly moving spectacle. Some were not pleased with the way in which aristocratic and poor would mingle together. They said that they were jumbled together as in a common grave, which is a rather dismal view of the gardens. But I think most people who came here would come to look at the statues, to enjoy walking in the trees, the sort of ambience of nature in what was becoming increasingly built up, urbanized London. They would sit and have dinner, and they would listen to music by Handel performed in front of the dinner boxes. Handel was a master of the grand musical statement, and modern audiences are still captivated by his bold, large-scale pieces, like the music for the Royal Fireworks, which was first heard at a legendary public rehearsal in Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens. public rehearsal of Handel's firework music made an enormous impact. There were huge numbers. London Bridge was the only route across the river, and so it was jam-packed with coaches and carriages, and apparently a group of footmen had a public brawl and some <laughs> nobleman got injured. And how many people do you actually think crammed in here to witness this spectacle? About 12,000. I think he always had his eye on popular success of a kind where he could do it without compromising his musical or artistic integrity. Handel was nearly 65 and still composing prolifically, but now he began to use his status as the country's leading composer to support charitable causes. The Foundling Hospital was Britain's first home for abandoned and illegitimate babies. William Hogarth was already a major benefactor, and Handel now decided to join him. God, looking at that, as with all Hogarth, you just sense just how seething and basically most people's experience of life was so unpleasant. As you see, you see all sides of 18th century life, the March of the Guards. He raffled it to raise money for the hospital, and he gave the spare tickets to the hospital. There was a few that were unsold, and one of those happened, perhaps not by chance, to be the winning ticket. So the hospital got the painting as well as the proceeds of the raffle. How did Handel come to be involved? He first turned up in the council committee minutes offering to do a benefit concert in 1749 and the concert was arranged within about three weeks and he wrote some new music for it, the Foundling Hospital Anthem to, um, and put it together with the other new music that he'd written that year to make a very popular sold-out concert. So this is clearly a way that he could make a difference. I mean, obviously Hogarth could auction paintings and so on, Handel had to do gigs. Yes, very much in the, the Live Aid theme of today, he did the benefit concerts of the 18th century. Blessed, blessed, blessed are they. Blessed, blessed are they that can. 
The anthem that Handel composed specially to be performed at his Foundling Hospital benefit concerts brilliantly demonstrates his ability to combine sincere spirituality with rigorous practicality. It's basically a recruiting song for the charity, but it works by inviting the listener into a sort of feel-good experience about charitable giving. Mrs. Handel's last will and testament. Um, he wrote a will in 1750, and he leaves a bequest of the score and parts of Messiah to the Foundling Hospital, which enable them to carry on their charity concerts after his death. Seeing Handel's will really fascinated me. His handwriting was as bold, clear and forceful as I imagine the man himself was. I was keen to see some more, particularly some of his actual music manuscripts. And in the British Library, they've conserved one of the most poignant, the manuscript for Jephthah, his last great oratorio. What happens is that in 1751-2, his eyesight starts to fail. This is Handel's, as it were, typical handwriting. Very few changes, and those that are made are made very, very clearly. He may leave some things, details of the orchestra to fill in later, but pretty well, by the time we're through, there's a draft of something for every movement. And when he gets to the bottom of this page, you see the 13th February, 1751. His annotation there is he couldn't go on because of the trouble with his eyesight and he couldn't do any more. Now, this was doubly troublesome, because not merely had he not finished the score, but the first night was only 10 days away. So he has to get something ready for there. And actually what we then find, down at the bottom of the next page, he says 10 days later, his eye is somewhat uh, recovered and he can go back to work. The really curious thing is, of course, that the trouble with his eyesight happens on the chorus, how dark, O oh Lord, are thy decrees. <laughs> The thing about it is 23rd of February actually was his birthday. It's suddenly become rather painfully autobiographical. Certainly so. There's a sense of fate about this. His creative life was over. It wasn't long before he'd lost the sight in both eyes. For the next few years, he struggled on, helped by assistants, revising old works and tirelessly promoting the performance of his music. Every time you get to know the music of a great composer, your exploration throws up lots of questions about who that person might be or might have been, because somehow the music will always feel autobiographical. Handel came to Britain and, as people so often claim, ended up becoming more British than the British. But for him personally, it must have always felt unusual to have made his whole world in a country where he would only ever be perceived as a foreigner. So he must have been a pretty, pretty strong individual able to take the knocks, that he could more or less completely reinvent himself. He knew what he wanted and he was damn sure he was going to get it. All great people who've achieved anything in any walk of life have had to be quite ruthless. But I find that a conundrum because his music is so deeply human and so potent and so theatrical, so come hither, so unputdownable.
and yet it seems to me the man behind the music must have been incredibly tough, which probably didn't make him very likeable. But goodness me, the legacy is worth volumes. One night, on returning from a performance of Massar at Covent Garden, Handel was seized with a sudden weakness, and he retired to his bed, never to rise again. On the 14th of April, 1759, he passed away peacefully at the age of 74. Over 3,000 mourners attended his funeral, which was given full state honors. After his death, his reputation would continue to grow, and the engine was Massar. In the years following Handel's death, Great Britain grew increasingly rich and powerful, and Handel's music became part of the very fabric of our national life. In the next episode of The Birth of British Music, I'll discover how, at the end of the 18th century, another foreigner, the Austrian Joseph Haydn, became our musical national hero. And the birth of British music continues here on BBC HD next Saturday at the slightly earlier time of five past seven. Next tonight, more music, and we're off to the proms.